Mitch, in reading, I went back and reread Tuesdays with Maury before reading the new book. And you know, looking at your own journey, I am initially just interested in transformation. I mean, you have an incredible transformation story. And here we all are in the personal development, self-help world. And we're looking at ourselves and the things that we want to do and grow and change in ourselves. And transformation, as you know, is dramatically rare. And when you look at yours, I can see people going, you know, I wish I had a Maury. I don't. I'm sure you've heard that a hundred times, but I'm going to ask you to speak to those folks wishing, I wish I had that big inciting incident in my life, but I don't. How do I have the radical transformation that Mitch had? Well, that's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, I, I had Maury in my life more than once. Uh, Maury was my college professor back at Brandeis University. I spent four years with him. I took every class that he offered. We walked around campus together. You know, we were really close. And yet, when I graduated, I was so interested in my own ambition yeah. that I really didn't, I, I lost touch with him for 16 years. Now, I had him in my life but I wasn't open at that time to realizing how special a guy he was. So for me, it was someone I was really close with during a stretch when I was at college, but then I had bigger fish to fry and I had to get out there. So I think it's as much about just being open to the idea of having a transformation, which at age 37, when I reconnected with him, now at this point, I had been out of school for 16 years I had been chasing my career. I've been chasing you know, my ambition. I had been rising and rising and rising and rising. I was doing very well, but clearly there must've been something in me that wasn't satisfied and that didn't feel like it was all that it was cracked up to be in order to reach back out to him again when I found that he was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease and then to end up going not one Tuesday or two Tuesdays or three Tuesdays, but every Tuesday that he had left in his life. So when you say, well, I don't have a Maury, so how can I do it? Well, I had a Maury twice. The first time I had Maury, I didn't even realize what I had. And so it's not just about what you have in your life that can help make you transform. It's first, it begins in your own heart. It begins in your own brain. It begins in your own outlook of saying, Maybe what I'm doing isn't, isn't working so great. Uh, and then you will begin a search. It just happens naturally. You know, if you're hungry, you go looking for something to eat, right? If you're thirsty, you go, where's there some water around here? And if you're hungering for something inside you, you will start to search and eventually it will lead you to whatever it is that's going to help you make that transformation. You don't have to wait for a gift wrapped old college professor to drop into your lap and start your life over again. Well, and then here we have the new book, The Stranger in the Lifeboat, and it obviously has great power in the people involved and involved with each other and reading both of them, but thinking about, you know, Maury as well, we end up talking a lot on the show about mentoring, about finding a mentor, have a mentor. And it's always out there. It's spoken of so often. The majority of the people that I have on this show that are in the books, you know, behind me will cite the people who had such great influence in their lives. And yet we're in a place, as you know, in our culture where we're so isolated, people are having a hard time connecting. But with your experience, how has it influenced your perspective of the need to connect with people for mentoring and however that shows up. Yeah. Well, I believe that mentoring comes in a lot of different forms. Okay. And I have had the traditional mentor, that being an older person who's had, you know, life experiences that I didn't have, perspective that I didn't have. He was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease. I wasn't. He was able yeah. to say this matters, this doesn't matter. You but I've also had mentors, I consider mentors, in the form of children. Hmm. I had a, a, a five, six, and seven-year-old little girl from the orphanage that I operate in Haiti, who we adopted when she developed a brain tumor, and, and, and uh, we brought her here to America, and she never went home, and she became our little girl. And we spent two years traveling around the world with her, and, she, and I was 
you know, a good 50, nearly 50 years older than her. But I will tell you that she taught me as much about life as Maury did. And in her own way of having survived an earthquake when she was three days old, having survived losing her, her mother when she was two years old and having the way she dealt with a brain tumor when she was five years old and her philosophy of life and her approach to uh, wonder in the world uh, that, you know, sometimes we think our mentors have to be gray haired and, and bearded and, and have to at least have 30 or 40 years on us so they can show us everything that they did that we're supposed to do, but that's not true. Mentors are just people who guide you and guidance can come from all kinds of people in your life, from your children, to your spouse, to your friends, to, you know, uh, to, to even strangers sometimes. Well, so coming back to what you said a moment ago, I had somebody on the show a few months ago who had, you know, one of these unbelievable rags to riches stories, you know, homeless to a hundred million dollars. And I asked a similar question and he gave a similar answer that you don't have to have that dramatic incident happen event in your life but you have to be open to it. So we're coming back to that, just being open to transformation. But as you have gone along this path for so long with your story and then walking with others and theirs, I want to ask, what do you see is one of our primary impediments to being open to transformation in our oh, culture? That's, that's easy. Okay. Uh, we've become a culture that believes that we can do everything ourselves. Uh, we create our own websites, we create our own images, we create our own Instagram page, we create our own audiences, we create, we, we do everything from inside our, our, our basements, and we can control the universe. And of course, uh, this is coupled with the fact that, sadly, we have raised children, and, and some of our children are now adults who have been raised this way and are doing it to their children, who can do no wrong, who are always right, who need to be protected from their feelings being hurt in any which sh shape or form to the point that, you know, while those are good notions, if you take them too far to the nth degree, what it ends up in is that nobody listens to anybody else. Nobody is open to anybody else because we are our own perfect creations, you know, uh, from our parents telling us that the, everything we do is right and, and every, every effort we make is great to our own creations of our personas and social media that, you know, in many cases are a facade, but we create them and, 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 and we want to, our, everybody wants to have their own startup. Everybody wants to be their own boss. And, and so the notion of like other people and the value of other people and learning from other people and being humbled by other people is becoming more and more alien as we become insular and, and become you know, a society of a, of, a, of a collection of selves instead of a community. Um, it's, it was much easier in the old days, you know, when, when you grew up in a neighborhood and there was an older guy who sat on his porch in his chair and you would find your way over to the, to the you know, uh, step and you'd be sitting on the step and he'd be in his chair. And next thing you know, he's giving you a little wisdom. And, there, and it was just, it was, it was the way it worked. Nobody, nobody ever said, oh, what do you know about it? You don't understand marketing and you don't understand, uh, you can't even fix an iPhone. So you know, the reverence that we used to have for older people and really people in general has dissipated as we have celebrated ourselves more and more. So it's very clear to me in my mind, that's the biggest impediment towards getting wisdom and guidance from others is this, is, is this belief that somehow we are better than everybody else. We are smarter than everybody else. We're more special than everybody else. I mean, you're at your, your perspective on community, it brings me to, I mean, we used to have to move a lot, for instance, just to exist. Today, we don't. Today, I can probably like you, I don't have to move from my bed if I didn't want to, as long as I can just whip the laptop over, I got Wi-Fi. I can have food delivered. And if I, you know, use a bedpan, I guess I could just stay right there and exist. And that did not used to be the case. So now I have to manufacture movement. And so I'll go and lift weights or exercise or run extraneously. I wouldn't have to otherwise. In the same aspect, I see that with community. Yeah, we used to need and rely. My grandparents relied on the community to exist. They could not be so self-sufficient. And here we are. And back to that thing, I can stay in bed, but then it's, I am my own God right. to that degree. Yeah. 
And uh, it's funny you say that because a lot of that was behind this new book, The Stranger in the Lifeboat, where the concept is about help and about asking for help from others or asking for help from God or the universe. You know, I created this crazy scenario where there's uh, this really expensive, luxurious yacht that owned by one of the richest people in the world. And he invites all his fancy friends and rich people on it. And then it explodes mysteriously in the middle of the ocean and everybody's killed except 10 people. And uh, five of them are the guests and five of them are the staff, you know, cooks and, and deckhands and the like. And they, they, they find their way to a life raft and they suddenly realize that there is no staff and, and there is no rich people. They're just all trying to survive in this life raft. And for three days, nobody's coming for them and there's no help. And, and they're running out of food and water and they're, they're uh, you know, see sharks in the water. And everything's as dire as it can be. And, and they're crying out for help in their own particular way. And then they see this body floating in the water and they pull it into the boat. And it's this young guy, very nondescript, average looking guy. And they pepper him with questions. He doesn't say anything. And finally, one of the passengers says, well, thank the Lord we found you. And he says, I am the Lord. Mm -hmm. And what happens from that point forward is exactly kind of what you're talking about, about are we ready to rely on others? or accept help from others or not. And even though these people are so desperate and they've been crying out, you know, in their own way, somebody save us, along comes this person who says, well, here I am, you were calling me, so I'm here. And they don't believe it. They go, oh, well, this is, this is some crazy guy who banged his head. Look at him, look at him, look at him. You know, he's too skinny, he falls asleep, he gets hungry, he's thirsty, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's nuts. And, right. and, and it's only after as days start to pass and things get worse and worse that some of them start to think, well, I don't know, maybe we, maybe he is here to help us. But it's that whole notion of like, no, 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 you know, we can do this ourselves and we don't need anything. And so I explored that whole idea of community. Ten people in a life raft is a community. It's the tightest community you're ever going to have yeah. because, you know, one of you eats, the other one doesn't. You see how dependent everybody is on one another. So in some ways, yeah, I've been dealing with this theme a lot in, in, in recent weeks, ever since the stranger in the light bulb came out. Well, on that aspect then of asking for help and going back to my perspective of, you know, we need to manufacture movement and exercise because we don't have to do it to survive. We have to manufacture to a degree community because we don't have to have it to exist, not to flourish. Maybe, I mean, we need to flourish, but you know, not to just exist. So when we look at asking for help, you know, so I'll, I'll put it to you because people are going to view you as Mitch, the, the celebrity he sold a zillion books and uh, you know, there's, there's TV and movies and yada, yada. So you're a celebrity. You're the last guy that needs help in the cultural perspective. You don't need help. And so there'd be the aspect here of thinking, Oh, you must need to manufacture that help and dependence. Or as I see you shaking your head, is it you realizing your drastic need and dependence? And that's where it comes. It doesn't have to be manufactured. Everybody needs help. Everybody needs a community. There is no level of success that extends you beyond that. None. You cannot buy your way out of needing other people. Uh, you cannot buy your way out of needing to be a part of a community. Now, you can choose to live alone. And you can choose to think, as you said, I'll just do everything from my bed. I'll order everything from my food to my medical care. Uh, and as long as I have enough money, I'll be able to do it. But, but that's, that's thinking that all I need is the physical presence of things, the physical presence of food, physical presence of other people, uh, all the rest. But you're, you're missing the whole point of life, which is the emotional presence and the humanity connection that you need to live a fulfilling life. And, and, when I, and when I say need, I mean, you know, there are people who die from loneliness. It, it's very, very true. It's not, it's not some concept. And, I, you know, the, the, I never think of success or accomplishment as taking you out of that. If anything, sometimes when you achieve a certain level of success, you can realize how empty that success is if you don't share it with other people, if you don't do some good with it to help other people, uh, you know, I saw this, I saw this quite early in my career, to be honest with you, when I was visiting with Maury Schwartz, who was the, you know, my professor of Tuesdays with Maury. And um, 
I'll tell you what, what happened. It's a very, very good example for people to remember. So here's this guy who's dying from Lou Gehrig's disease. He can't move. He needs to be carried from place to place. His legs are shot. His arms are pretty much gone. You have to turn his head, you know, just to see you. Um, and people would come to visit him and they would try to cheer him up because they would say, he's dying. So I need to cheer him up. And they would prepare like, I don't know, photos of their families or stories or whatever. They go in with a game plan. And after five minutes, uh, they would start talking and then he would start asking them questions. And then he'd start, start asking them questions. They'd come out of the room crying an hour later about like their job, their divorce, their love life. And I, I watched this happen so many times. And they said, I don't know, I went in to try to cheer him up. But next thing I knew, like, he was asking me questions and he was making me feel better. And I was telling him everything that was going on. So I went to him, I said, I don't understand. You're dying from Lou Gehrig's disease. You can't move. You need somebody to carry you to the toilet, to wipe your rear end. You've hit the mother load of sympathy you could take right now. And everybody would say, of course, of course you should take. You're in that position. Why don't you do it? And he looked at me as if I stepped out of a spaceship and he said, Mitch, why would I ever take from people like that? taking just makes me feel like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. And it is a profound sentence, also rhymes, it's easy to remember. Giving makes you feel like you're living. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that moment. And I said, wow, he's 78, he's dying. And the thing that makes him feel the best about himself is when he gives to somebody else. This must be true of the rest of life. And I, I, that year I started my first charity. I now have, my life is largely about charities. The 60, 70% of my work week is just about that. I have nine charities I operate here in Detroit and I have an orphanage in Haiti that I'm at every single month for the last 12 years. And I will be for the rest of my life with 53 kids. And it has absolutely proven to be true that I am way more alive when I am involved in those things and giving then and when I'm involved with things you're taking. So that proves the point that you're asking me about, about you must be involved with other people to really feel like, you know, you're doing what you're here on earth to do and to really feel, feel a, more, a, more, a more fulfilling life. So on that note right there, it's curious to me. I mean, we have a, I have an aspiring audience. They're not off listening to, you know, NPR's crime drama. Right. They're listening to this because they want to better themselves, better their lives. So I call them an aspiring crowd. It's also a very faith-based audience for the most part. And as they look at this, here you are. And as you said, you're full of, this is past, you know, before more full of ambition, you're going and doing that. And of course, in reading Tuesdays with Maury, he talks so much about, I don't want to say against, but he cautions you in the book against the pursuit of these achievements, just this ambition. And what does it, what does it matter to a degree as opposed to the real fruits of life? So here you are all these years later. Uh, I think I saw it was you're around 24 years after Tuesdays with Maury was yeah. published. Yeah. Other books, great successes, um, charities, you've got all these things. So it's, it's curious. I mean, that, that's, again, that would be a holy grail achievement for most people. I found my calling, right? I found this, this calling, this conviction, and, and you're doing that. And yet you're still doing some of the same vocational activities as you were back then. You're still sports casting. Uh, you're still involved in that. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I would call that vocational. Uh, okay. That's, that's more professional. Okay. Uh, you know, and I, I did that before and I maintain some of it now, mostly because here in Detroit where I live, um, you know, I've become known after 30 years in the newspaper as a, as a voice on sports here in this community. And I, I do a little bit of it. I, I'm not a full-time sports columnist by any, by any stretch of the imagination. I do a little bit of sports broadcasting uh, like I used to do on ESPN because it's something that interests me. And it's a specialty that, you know, if you've got 30 years of experience in sports and you know, all the athletes and the coaches, it's a shame to sort of just walk away from it, but I don't do it for money and I don't do it for accomplishment or for, or for, you know, uh, trying to climb any ladders. I'm, I'm a much smaller version of that than I used to be. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I think you balance your interests with your purpose, you know, yeah. and if you can mesh, your purpose and your interests together, 
um, you've got a very harmonious existence. And, and I managed to do that. You know, I, I do a radio program, for example, here in Detroit, because I've been doing radio for over 30 years here in Detroit. And but I, I use that radio program. For example, next week, I'll do 15 hours on the radio straight from six in the morning till nine o'clock at night. And I will raise somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.5 million in a single day. And I only say that because that's what we've done the last several years for needy people here in Detroit. I use this platform that I've been given and I invite every famous person I've ever met, every actor, every athlete, every everybody to come on and they all say yes. And they give us five minutes and they pop on and they encourage people, hey, give, and this is a good thing, whatever. And we raise an incredible amount of money in a single day and that money funds these charities that we operate and 100% of it goes right to the needy and we don't take any administrative costs or anything. And I'm able to do that because I have this platform. You know, if I walked away from the platform and said, well, I, you know, I'm going to go live in a tree uh, because that's what's important in life. I wouldn't actually be able to, uh, you know, do a lot of the good that I do. That's one of the things that honestly, Kevin, I've found that people um, misunderstand about Tuesdays with Maury. Like they think that Maury somehow wanted me to quit my jobs and go go into a tree and hum all day long, you know? And he never wanted that. He said, you have a really important job. You're a voice in the community, but you need to use that voice for something more than just aggrandizing yourself. Use it to galvanize people. So, you know, there is a way of doing both things. And I think your audience, as you say, they're, they're achievers and they're people who, who do. Uh, one doesn't have to negate the other. You can be a good citizen of the world and a good human being and still be busy. You know, you, you, don't, you don't have to just be meditating all day long in order to do that. And that's what I was hunting for right there, because I can see we, I mean, we have often, and I'm sure you've seen it so, so much, people who are looking for, like, I'm going to use that word calling. It's kind of a faith-based thing, but today, secularly, we would say purpose. You're looking for that big thing. And what a great fruition of that, that you had with Tuesdays with Maury's, uh, with Maury, it transformed your life. You talk about that so openly. And from that, it would be easy to see, especially in a faith-based context that, oh, that that's it. So that's a hundred percent your calling. Now you leave the, I'll use that word secular again, just because people understand that you leave that pursuit and you go over here and commit yourself to yeah, what, however you want to say it to the Lord, to purpose, to, to this conviction, you leave that. And you're saying, no, they, I love that you saying, you know, there's the balance. I think a lot of people need to hear that because we know that people will leave things and go over here and because you know, I'm going to serve the Lord. So I got to become a pastor. And we see so many errant uh, pursuits yeah. in that frame. So I, I appreciate you saying, no, you're, you're walking it out here as a sportscaster or yeah. whatever. Right. Use you, you know, God will use you where you are. And, uh, you know, if the world were all pastors, there'd mean, be no congregations. So yeah. you know, at some point, uh, everybody has to fill a, a little bit of a different role. And, you know, look at what Rick Warren did with the, with the book, The Purpose Driven Life. I mean, that that was a massively successful book, made a lot of money for him, which then I understand he gave to very good purposes and all the rest of it. Uh, but but he could have just said, no, I'm a pastor. I don't have time to write books. You know, I, I need to tend to my flock and, and deal only with their small issues that are here. But he he's obviously knows how to write and he knows how to preach. And he did a great job with that. And that has had a profound effect on the world, that, that book. And yet, you know, he continues to also do his, his preaching and, and that world. So I think there are a lot of ways to skin the cat, I guess, is, is what I'm saying. But, but you... Yeah, I've never found that you need to walk away from everything that's quote unquote secular in order to lead a life that has purpose. I think you can use the secular world to great effect, to create purpose, to further purpose and to fund purpose if you you know are smart about it. I have questions on the book as well here, you know, and just reading and really studying The Stranger in the Boat. And I have uh, I've been fortunate enough to have enough interviews that I've had some where people read into things that I've done, things that I didn't actually have in there. So with that said, if I miss it here, if I miss the boat, I'll just edit it out. That's the beauty of a podcast. Uh, okay. So I still look smart. 
But I, it's interesting as you looked at the, as I looked at each chapter and you have in each chapter, you have sea, land and news. And it just was curious to me because I looked at it and in the reference of the book, the sea was the place of uncertainty. That was, that was the risk. That was the uncertainty. That was the, uh, the submission. And then over here, you revert to land and land. I'm thinking in the book, I'm kind of feeling, I, I feel safer. It's like watching somebody drowning on a TV show or, or a movie. And I'm sitting on my couch, taking a deep breath because I can feel it. So the land is safety though. And then you have the news which to me was perspective. And we're in a time when I feel like we are more influenced by the news, by the media, by social media, by all this stuff more than ever. And it's perspective, which is not reality. And so I'm, I was playing with uncertainty, safety, and perspective. So I'll ask you, am I just reading more into those three divisions of the chapter than, uh, than I need to be? Or did you have some purpose in those? No, that, it's very insightful. And uh, no, I, I didn't, I didn't choose that willy nilly. I did it, you know, very much along the lines of what you uh, broke down with what people who may not understand it, the, the book itself is told from three different perspectives. Yeah. And whenever the chapter reads C, it's what's happening out in this life raft with these 10 people who are trying to survive with one additional passenger who claims to be God. Whenever it says land, it's a year later when the, the same life raft has washed up on the shore of a Caribbean island empty with nobody in it, except a notebook that was hidden in a pouch, which tells the story of what happened with these 10 people and this person who claimed to be God. And then the news is the media constantly popping in at different points along the storyline and reporting on what's happening, reporting on when the ship goes down, reporting on when they, they find the life raft, reporting on whether they want to go examine the water again and see if it's, something's there. And one, the last paragraph of the book, I'm not giving anything away, but the last paragraph of the book says, in the end, there is the sea, the land, and the news that happens between them. Mm -hmm. And and that is the kind of the world, you know? Uh, and as you said, the uncertainty of the sea or where God is located because this character claiming to be God is out there in the, in the uncertainty and the land where we all live and we all think that this is, you know, this is it because, uh, you know, we're on the land. So therefore, we would and then the news, which is the way that we view ourselves, you know, the, the uh, uh, as Paul Simon said in one of his songs, the way we look to us all, you know, the way the way that we the way the camera follows us in slow motion, you know, the way we look to us, we're always watching ourselves and analyzing ourselves. So, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too esoteric, but you, you, you you're pretty good. <laughs> you make a good book reviewer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's uh, I'm grateful that it is part of my uh, part of my my work that I can't separate from my personal life. Because yeah, this book I'm sitting here reading it, knowing we're going to do this, and yet I was I I really read parts of it twice, and I went back and I continue to ruminate on the last chapter, chapter twelve. And as I look at that, we're kind of coming back to where we started talking about transformation. What opens me to transformation and, you know, being broken is a very, I feel it's a very faith-based term. We don't talk about that outside of a faith-based context, but I still look at it and I see so many stories of significant transformation. It came from people, regardless of their faith, from an aspect of being broken or, or releasing or submitting. And you come, I think it's right at the beginning of chapter 12. And I have it in my notes where you have the main character, Benji writing. And he says, I'm still at sea, but I'm no longer at war with it. That, that right there, I'll just own that one. That one uh, broke me a little bit. Because I want that. I, I, I see in my own journey and some of my anxieties and lack of peace uh, that I, I, feeling that. And, it, and now that I'm, I'm 50, I feel like I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm so tired of, of some of the war. And for you to write that, I'm still at sea, but I'm no longer at war with it. I may live or die. It doesn't matter. A shroud has been lifted. That's hard to hold, though, because we still have we're back to that aspect of achievement. And you're not saying that we just sit here and give up and sit on the couch. I'll ask you to reconcile that because you're not saying that. So at one hand, he's submitting, though, for somebody like me reading it in the comforts of my office or my home. It's not that I'm saying I may live or die. It doesn't matter. Actually, no, I'll just I'll just I'll toss that to you and help me. Right. 
Well, so some perspective on, yep. on that. You're you're taking that those lines and applying them to your life, and yes. it's really interesting to hear that. With regard to how they apply to the story, and yeah. really it applies to me. Uh, th- your listeners need to have a, a, just a, a dollop of backdrop. So I mentioned that I adopted my wife and I adopted this little girl Chica was her name right. from Haiti. And she lived with us for, for, well, two years. She was told, we were told that she would die in four months. She had this terrible brain tumor, DIPG, and they said she's going to be dead in four months. This kills everybody. Take her back to Haiti and let her die. And we said, no, she's a fighter. We, we know this child. She's been in our orphanage for, for three years, and she's bossy and pushy and loud, and she's a fighter, and we're going to fight with her. And we spent two years traveling around the world trying to find a cure. And uh, she lived two years, not four months. And those two years were the greatest two years my wife and I had because we had a family. We, we never had children of our own. Uh, we have 53 orphans that we were, we, you know, we take care of every month. Yeah. But here was a child sleeping at the base of our bed, doing everything that a five-year-old does, you know, waking you up and breakfast and squealing when snow comes down and putting her hand over my mouth when I would sing along with her and all the funny things that she did. And, um, and then she died. And I was extremely angry uh, when she died. I was angry with God and I was angry at the universe. And my feeling was, you know, how can there be a benevolent God who can't be benevolent to a seven-year-old? You know, she, she survived an earthquake when she was three days old. She lost her mother when she was two years old. She got a brain tumor when she was five years old. How much more do you have to throw at a child? And this book, The Stranger in the Life Wrote, was written as a healing to that anger and to that uh, frustration, that war that you're referring to. Yeah. And in the book, Benji, who's na- the narrator of the, of the notebook that is read a year later, he lost his wife. He's just a substitute for me. His wife is just a substitute for our little girl. And at one point prior to him writing what you just quoted, he confronts this God character with the ultimate question that we all would ask, and I'm sure you would ask if you got God on your podcast instead of me, which would be an eminently more interesting podcast than I have. Be, be good for uh, ratings, yeah. Yeah, be very good for ratings. And he asks him the question, Benji, breaking down and crying, why did my wife have to die? Why did you take my wife? Which was basically me saying the same thing to God about my child. And the response that comes is, when people die on earth, their loved ones always say, why did God take them? Yeah. Maybe a better question would be, why did God give them to us? Yeah. What did we do to warrant their love, their affection, the special moments? Didn't you have moments like that with your wife? And Benji says, every day. And the God character says, well, those moments are a gift but their absence is not a punishment. I'm not here to be cruel to you. I know that you cry when people leave this earth and they die, but I can assure you they're not crying. And I wrote that for myself as much as I did for any reader. But I know that people have embraced that if they've lost somebody because you have to come to that place where you are not at war with the world as it exists. And before Kevin, anything about jobs or accomplishment or, or, or ambition, you have to deal with life and death. And you have to deal with the fact that you are going to lose people that you love, or you are going to be lost to people who love you. That's a far more fundamental question than how do I make peace with my desire to be CEO before I'm 50, you know? And that was the war that Benji was at war with, that he, why did his wife have to die? And he blamed himself. He blamed he didn't have enough money for her medical care and things like that. Just as I blame myself for our daughters. Well, maybe I missed something. Maybe there was a part of the world that we should have gone to and we, we, we didn't find. Maybe it was an experimental treatment, one more, not that we didn't try 10 experimental treatments, but maybe the 11th one would have been the one that would have kept her alive. That kind of inner torture, I needed to come to peace with. And it was ultimately accepting the fact that, wait, what did we do, my wife and I, to warrant getting a child in our mid-50s and getting to be parents? A prayer that we had asked for 15, 20 years earlier and didn't get. 
and suddenly it gets answered and we get to be parents with this amazing kid for two years. That was a gift. And yeah, it was only seven years that she lived, but some kids only live three years and some kids only live 20 minutes. And some parents get to hold their baby for, for three minutes and then the, the baby expires. So compared to that, we were blessed. And if you can just tend to look at the things that have happened in your life as a gift, however long they were, however long they lasted, you are so much more comforted even when you lose them than if you always come at it from the perspective of why was that taken from me? Yeah. Now, now apply that to the subject matter of your show more normally, your accomplishments, your job, your, your success. Well, people get fired. Why was that taken from me? You know, they don't get the promotion that they wanted. Why was that taken from me? You know, they never say, well, what did I do to be even considered for that? I'm way ahead of how many other people behind me who were never even going to be considered for. It. What did I do to have that job for the years that I had it? You know how many other people would have loved to have had that job while I did have it? If you can tend to look at it that way, your war out in the ocean ends and you are at peace with, you know, that the existence of the world. And that doesn't mean you live in an ashram and that doesn't mean you stop doing anything. Yeah. No, it just means that you don't take every bad thing that happens as a body blow that doubles you over and leaves you incapable of, of going forward because life will throw too many of those at you. You can't react that way. Mitch, I've got that entire page, which is page 241. Mm. Marked all up because to me, it was worth the price of admission. Um, that line right there, a better question would be, why did God give them to us? And as you describe it there, it brings me to a word that we're batting around a lot right now, which is privilege. Yeah. Um, and it's become a, a topic we talk about in my family. And I've been looking at a lot now as well. But again, I keep referencing you know, the faith, faith-based world that I grew up in. And we would often talk about, you know, I, I, I'm so blessed. That's a great thing. I'm so blessed. And I had a friend one time say, oh, so I'm not blessed. Why was I not blessed with that, Kevin? And, and we've been playing with it because it's important with how we look at that perspective. But for me to say I'm privileged, why am I, why did I get to grow up in America? I'm a six foot tall white American male. I am the most privileged uh, species on planet earth. Am I grateful for that? Am I, as you said, why there's so many people that didn't get that privilege. Am I grateful for that? As opposed to just looking at what I don't have. And it's a radical, it's pithy, but it's a radical radical mind shift. I, I, I'll, I'll be referencing that for a long time. I'll be sharing that page with my family. And I do want to ask you, I'm going to take the, I'm going to deviate a second. So I wasn't going to go here, but with you talking about Chica, this is an issue that continues to come up with people as we really get deep, Mitch. And it's looking at that. And here you have this little girl and you have reconciled what happened with her. And yet it's really easy. We, we played with this on a show recently of saying, you know, Mitch, somebody probably said this to you. She, she could died. You didn't get the cure all in God's plan. It's for you. It's a message you needed to have Mitch. It's, it's, it's for your benefit. And in your place as a father, I'm looking at it and going, I, I don't really like that God who had her die for my benefit that he looked down and said, you know what? I got a plan over here. So I'm going to, I'm going to snub her out um, for you. And of course we had people who had tragic things, had a daughter, you know, who would be uh, abducted and abused and whatnot. And for people to say, oh, it's all in God's plan. You know, that he had a plan. He'll wreck, he'll redeem that. It's all good. And I'm going, I don't, I don't accept that. And with you sharing that you had the anger that you have, it's one thing for you to see that there is reconciliation, there is redemption, but to look at that and to try to justify that is God's plan. That leaves a lot of people in a lurch. Yeah. Well, I'll answer that with, uh, another small episode from this book, because I contemplate Please. a lot of these questions in the yeah. book. Uh, because a lot of what you're saying is, well, a lot of what you're saying are, these are the questions I have for God, you know, give me five minutes with God and I yeah. will, you know, I'll put them yeah. to the test. You know, how did you let this happen? How did you let this happen? So there's this moment in the book where one of the passengers takes his own life in the middle of the night, uh, not, not, horribly he wants to be with his wife in heaven and he's convinced she's there and he doesn't want to 
take any more from the other passengers and you know have to share the food and so in the middle of the night when everybody's sleeping he throws himself overboard when they wake up he's gone and they turn on this god character and they blame him they get angry with him and benji in particular says you know did you know that was going to happen and he says well yeah i know i know everything that's going to happen and 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 he's and he gets angry he seethes at him he says if you were really god you would have stopped it. Right, exactly. And the response is, God starts things, man stops them. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, I believe that we have everything in this world to make a perfect world. We have all the resources that we could feed every hungry person on the planet. We could cure all disease. Look at what we did with the vaccine in a year when we put our mind. So you mean to tell me if we made a global effort to wipe out cancer with that kind of money and that kind of thing, we couldn't do the same thing. Of course we could. We could do it to anything. We just choose not to. We pursue our own individual things, our own nationalistic things, our own personal successes, all the rest of it. So when you think about bullets, bombs, guns, nicotine, alcohol, God didn't make those things. We made those things and we use them to do some of these awful things that happen in the world, including abductions and, and, and things like that. And so to say, well, God would have stopped it. I don't think that's the way God designed the universe. Otherwise, God would jump in every time we were about to crash our car. God would jump in every time someone slipped on the side of a mountain, you know, uh, because God loves us. Why would God let any harm be befall us? I don't think God comes out of the sky with a big hand and, and does all things. So first you have to accept that. And then if you can accept that, then you say, all right, the things that even fall outside those categories, so they don't involve a bomb or a bullet or, or a bad choice by a human being or something like that, but a disease, um, you have to sort of write that off to, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm with you. I don't like a God who has a plan to take a seven-year-old child, yeah. but I have to focus on the part of that seven-year-old child changed our lives dramatically. That seven-year-old child brought joy into so many people's lives. I wrote a book about her that comforted a lot of people who lost children. Look at the ripple effect that she had. Look at the ripple effect that Maury has in, in, he never read a word of Tuesdays with Maury, never read a word. And I only wrote that book to pay his medical bills. It wasn't supposed to be a book that reached you or anybody else. It was going to be a local little book. They printed 20,000 copies and we took all the money, and just paid his medical bills. But look what happened. It's being taught in Sweden and China and Switzerland and uh, Australia and all these places in school systems for a guy who's not even here to teach it anymore. So in some ways, his life continues on. You know, Chica's life continues on. I have to say, I don't understand the plan of a God who has a world like that, but I can accept the fact that I don't understand it. That is a hard thing for people to do because nobody likes to accept their own limitations. Everybody wants to figure everything out like we talked about earlier. So nobody ever wants to reach the end of the line and just say, well, I'm just gonna have to say, I don't understand it. But there are things in, in this world that we just are not going to understand. And that doesn't mean you therefore have to stop believing in God or therefore have to think that this was God's maniacal plan to torture us. You just have to say that there's some things I don't understand. And, and you know, we get trained for this when we're kids and um, our parents tell us no to something that we really, really want. And if you think back to when you were a child and you wanted it so much and your parents said no, and you said, why? And they said, because I said so. And it was never a satisfying answer. And you went to bed angry and resentful and, and, and you didn't get it, but you accepted the fact that they were your parents and they said no. And the alternative would be no parents, no, 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 yes, no anything. And that's the alternative world is, well, there can't be a God because bad things happen. Okay, then there's nothing. There's no purpose to the universe. There's nothing that happens afterwards. Is that more satisfying? 
or is it is it more satisfying to think that there's wonder and grandeur and all these amazing things that we can attribute to a God. And there's some things that we just don't get. There's sometimes, as, as this God character says in the book, he's asked, do you answer every prayer? And he says, I answer every prayer. But sometimes the answer is no. Yeah. And we need to accept that if we want to get through this world without constantly torturing ourselves mentally. And thank you. Um, you know, some of this, as we come around circle to me asking you about ambition, asking you about achievement, uh, along with your calling, with your purpose. One of the lines again in chapter 12 that I'm brought back to is Benji writing, saying there's much less of me. Now for context, as you've been given context for that, he says, he says that, and he's actually writing, there's much less, less of me, and he means literally. His, his, you know, his appendages, yeah, his appendages are smaller. Uh, he's, he's lost so much weight. His clothes are tattered, uh, gone. But as I read that, I'm thinking much less of me. And it got me on the topic of humility and much less of me as in ego is, is really what I was pondering. And yet you have not, I'm going to, I'm going to, you wrote it for you, as you said. So I'm going to bring it back to you. You have not minimized yourself. And, and, you know, one of the definitions of humility is not thinking uh, less of myself, but thinking of myself less, which is an interesting one to ponder. I don't know that I think that that totally clears the definition, but, you know, in that here's you, Mitch, writing that much less of me. And if I'm, you know, correct in, maybe that going towards ego. And yet you're still here. You're on this podcast. You're not, you're not minimizing. Like you said, you're not up in a tree humming and saying, no, I shun all publicity and benefit. Uh, It's another one to reconcile because you know, people get stuck here. Yeah. Well, I guess it depends on your uh, viewpoint of not just humility, but why God put us here. Um, I think God, put us here to become the best versions of ourselves that we can. And if every generation sat in a tree and hummed and just thanked the Lord for existing, there'd be no difference, no advancement, no progression from 10,000 years ago to now. We'd all, that would be our existence. For many animals, that pretty much is true. That an animal's life today is the same as an animal's life 10,000 years ago. You know, scurry for food, uh, give birth to children, protect the children, die. Um, There's a reason that we were given these brains and given this development. There's a reason that we changed and we evolved as as time went on, whereas many elephants uh, have not, uh, elephants, I think, many animals have not. Um, And so I think there's a reason for that. And I think God wants us to become the best versions of ourselves that we can. And that means doing new things and exploring new things. But nowhere does that have to be concurrent with, therefore, you think of yourself as a god. Hmm. And, I, I, you know, the, the, the people who, uh, who built the Tower of Babel, which is one of the earliest stories in the Bible, early, early, it's way early on, um, they already were thinking of, of themselves as gods. So it's not something that like only happens as we get further into history. And now we become, you know, this is, they they were thinking of it thousands of years ago. And they said, let's just climb to the clouds and we'll get up there and we'll be the boss. You know, all we got to do is get up there and we'll be the boss. Same, that same desire to think of yourself as the most important thing has been around since the beginning of time. And that is the thing that we, when you are humble is when you lose that. And when you don't feel the need to have that to go forward, ambition does not require you to think of yourself as more important than anything else. It does not. It, it, and, and, and an accomplishment does not therefore mean that you are putting things in front of people or things in front of God. I, I started here in Detroit. I, I always loved uh, uh water ice i probably most of your audience doesn't even know what that is but in philadelphia there's a italian ices uh and they call it water ice and i grew up on this stuff because that's where i grew up in philadelphia and and i've lived in detroit my whole adult life and i always wonder why don't they have water ice here they have water ice here because it'd be a great business of water ice here 
And uh, at one point in operating our charities in Detroit, uh, you know, I, it was getting to the point where I was going to people and they were already like <laughs> walking the other direction because they knew I was going to hit them up. For, yeah, could you help us with our charity? Help us with the charity. I said, there's got to be another way to raise money besides just asking people. And I had this idea that I had about water ice from 25 years ago popped in my head. I flew to back to New Jersey and where I grew up and I went to this little water ice place which was always one of the great water ice places. Uh, and I said, there was a mom and pop operation. I walked into a couple, they were there. And I said, hi, uh, you know, my name's Mitch Album. I live in Detroit. Oh yeah, we think we heard of you. I sort of wrote the book too, this morning. Oh yeah, 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 we know the book. I said, listen, this is gonna sound strange, but have you guys ever thought of doing anything for charity? And the woman said to me, it's so funny that you're here. I was just in, in church this past Sunday and I was asking Jesus to, you know, like, uh, send me an idea that I can help, how I can make a difference. So I made a joke. I said, well, Jesus sent me. And, uh, and it turned out they came to Detroit, taught a group of people that I gathered together how to make water ice, how to create this stuff. And we opened a store in downtown Detroit that I got rent free, thanks to, because I told them what I was going to do with it from, from, uh, from uh, Dan Gilbert and, uh, and, and uh, Quicken Loans. They own this place right in a beautiful spot in downtown Detroit. And we opened a water ice store where all the money that we make, we give back to help fund our charities. But other than that, it's a business. It's, it's a cool store. It's got cool signs and cool signage and, and amazing flavors that have cool names and everything. It could be in San Francisco. It could be in, it could be in Faneuil Hall in Boston. It could be anywhere except we give all the money to charity. That's the only difference. And it does blockbuster business and it's hugely successful. And you know what? I was very ambitious about it. I wanted it to do well. Right. I wanted all that. I'm going to get all the signs up and get the publicity. I did all the TV shows to talk about it. We invited celebrities to come in. Everything you do, except its ultimate purpose is to give money to charity. But meanwhile, it pays, it created about 35 jobs and it pays, you know, people their jobs and all. So, you can combine that kind of ambition and still do good. There's no reason to stop. That is a reason not to do the TV programs and not to get a nice sign or not to do any of that. It's just that your ultimate purpose shouldn't be about just yourself. And that's a, just a small example I can give you of how you can combine those, those sort of you know, impulses. I feel kind of isolated. I've never heard of water ice. I, I, looked, it, I looked it up. It literally, it literally says water ice, better known as Italian ice, is an iconic summer treat in the Philadelphia area, yeah. according to uh, Dr. Google. Uh, I'm going to end where the book ended, Mitch, and I'm trying to do it tactfully without a spoiler. Um, the end of the book, main character plunges into the water, carrying something. Yeah. And what I read into that, and I'll let you, def I'll let you explain it was the aspect of taking that thing that is maybe my guilt, maybe my shame, maybe that thing that I allow to minimize me and, uh, taking that and, and letting it go ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell us more. That's exactly right. Yeah. He takes a, uh, yeah, I shouldn't say what it is. It'll ruin the book, but it's something very heavy yeah. and it sinks him to the bottom of the ocean. And he's convinced that this is how he's going to die. Uh, and then suddenly it's gone and he looks up and he sees that light that is created a refracted light that if you're down in the bottom of the ocean, there's actually a name for this. I forget what it is, but you see a circle of light and basically you can see the whole sky through that little circle of light from down below in the ocean. It's, it's a trick of, of uh, light and how it refracts, but you see the whole sky in that little circle. And he looks up and he basically says, he realizes that that's heaven on earth. And, uh, and he, had to, he loses his fear of dying. But in a larger sense, um, what we carry is what defines us. And I wrote at the end of Finding Chica, the book about our little girl that when she couldn't walk anymore, um, I had to carry her from place to place, which was just fine by her. She was all for it, you know, but I was the only one who could lift her. I had to take her to the bathroom, take her to the car, take her wherever we would go. And we were, we were, we were coloring one afternoon and um, I looked at my watch. I realized I was late for work and I popped up. I said, Chica, I got to go. And she said, no, Mr. Mitch, stay and color with me. I said, Chica, I have to work. And she said, Mr. Mitch, I have to play. 
And I said, yeah, but it's not the same thing. I have, this is my job. And she crossed her arms and she looked at me and she made that pouty face. And she said, no, it isn't. Your job is carrying me. And, you know, after I laughed, I realized, wow, that was one of those sentences sent right from above because of course my job was carrying her. You know, all of our jobs is to carry our children and, 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 and through sickness and through health. And if you're blessed to have the resources as I've been blessed, then it's our job to carry the children of the world, you know, who are sick and who are forgotten and who are abandoned like the orphans we take care of. And I realized like this image of me holding Chica, when I had this photo of me just holding her as I was carrying her around. And I realized up to that point in my life, before she came into it, I filled my arms with my work, with my books, with my accomplishments, with my money, you know, my investments, all that. That's, that's why I spent my time walking around thinking about and all that. And all of a sudden I had to drop all that because I had to spend all this time with Chica. We were with her 24 hours a day. We, we, we lived in Germany. We lived in New York. We, we had to try to cure her. And so now my arms were filled with a, a five, six and seven year old girl. And it was the best time of my life. And it was the best use of my arms ever. And what, what we carry defines us. And she defined those years. And, and, and so what he carries into the water is what had defined him all that time, his guilt, you know, over what he thought he had done, his shame, his anger. And when he finally lets it go and fills his arms with something more important, he's light and he floats instead of sinking, he floats all the way back up to the surface and, and comes out into that, into the light again. And um, that's how I sort of felt, you know, uh, with Chica and, uh, you know, and, and uh, I think that's how, you know, all of us feel when we fill our arms with something that's, that's fulfilling. That line right there, what we carry defines us. Uh, could be the title to this episode. It's incredibly impacting for me to think about as we switch off the podcast and I go forward, I'm going to go forward. I'm going to carry something. I'm going to carry my worries, my anxieties, my ambitions, my kids. Uh, what am I going to carry that defines me? That's convicting. Uh, Mitch, man, thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing your heart, your insight, continuing to share your story. Uh, I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm a grateful student and recipient of it. Uh, thank thank you. you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me on your program.